All right, we are a month, a month into this Colts head coaching search, but as Jim Irsay said yesterday, days, not hours. Sounds like an episode of General Hospital, but here we are, Colts head coaching search nearing a conclusion. I'm Kevin Bowen, Eddie Garrison with me. Uh, Eddie, I I don't think I, I would have guessed a month ago on the podcast, I don't think I would have been too shocked by around the Super Bowl, and that's where we're at right now for this Colts head coaching decision. Uh, With our luck, they will make a decision here in the next two hours, and this podcast will have zero validity. But hopefully, uh, the plural of days will be utilized here just for the sanctity of this podcast. Um, And we'll see how the rest of the week plays out. You know, Typically, you don't see coaches announcing or teams announcing uh, coaching hires the week of the Super Bowl. And Eddie, I... Well, first off, good to see you. Likewise, and I was about to say that uh, aren't hours days? Well, I thank you for that technicality. And the, you know, you are the kids that I used to look at in class and you know mumble, "Just shut up." Well, that's just from working with Mark Boyle. Well, too many times. Yeah, that is one unique brain to say the least. There, um, sure, you are correct on that. I think a lot of this patience, thoroughness, however you want to describe it couple of things, Eddie. One, I think it's Jim Mercer letting Chris Bauer do his job. Yeah. And you know what? Good on the owner. We can debate Chris Bauer. We can debate if he should be having a seventh season. That's a perfectly fine debate. I'm frankly shocked he's still here for a seventh year. But you know what? He is here. And if you're going to have a GM in place... Let that GM do their job, and that is what Ursay to me, is doing. We'll see who the final name is, but right now I think he's let Chris Bauer run the search how Bauer has wanted to run it. I think a lot of this Colts patience just stems from embarrassment, egg on the face, scar tissue, however you want to describe Chris Bauer's emotions right after Josh McDaniels did what he did in 2018. And you know what? If I were Ballard, I'd probably have the same feelings. Like you, for eight hours, Eddie, the Colts had Josh McDaniels as their head coach. Plastered on the website. Plastered yeah. on their social media. Mm-hmm. Hell, you probably sent out like marketing and, and, and ticketing elements that had Josh McDaniels on it. And then he you know, stabs you in the back. You sure as hell <laughs> do not want to go through that again. So, I don't know this for sure. But my guess is we will not hear the Colts make an announcement until Penn has been put to paper. Because, like, look at how Carolina announced Frank Reich. Agreed to terms, and then four days later, he does a press conference. Sean Payton announced, and then three days later, he does a press conference. Yeah. Like, I I don't think we'll get that with the Colts. Maybe we will. Maybe they'll they'll feel comfortable doing that. But just based off how that went, how many times do you not hear the free agent signings officially announced by the Colts until really, really official on that end. Like, yeah. They have just been so cautious when it comes to that stuff, understandably, since the McDaniels thing happened. So I think some of that plays into it. On today's pod, we'll get into the pros and cons of the reported second interview candidates. And I wanted to do this, Eddie, because I certainly have guys that I would consider above others on the list. Agreed. You know, some that you'd slot more to the favorite category. But I think think I've come to the conclusion too in looking at this that you can I I can understand any of these names outside of maybe one I can pretty much understand where the Colts would be coming from in hiring that person again I might not necessarily agree with it yeah but I can understand and I think some of the names that might give fans a little bit more pause than others fall under the in the Colts eyes they fall under the trait that Jim Irsay said back in early November and Eddie the night that Jeff Saturday was hired and the night that Frank Reich was fired Jim Irsay said when you're looking for head coaches leadership is the number one thing that's the number one thing and so I've had this debate with myself here over the last couple weeks leader Offense, leader, offense. And honestly, if you look at these names left, you pretty much can group all of them into one of those two categories. And in a perfect world, you would blend both of them. Yeah. But that's probably a bit unrealistic. So 
Um, any other, I guess, just overall coaching thoughts, feelings, Eddie, before we get into the pros and cons of some of these guys? Uh, I wanted to ask you that. Do you think this? Do you think this search has gone on for so long because they have a guy in mind and he's coaching in the Super Bowl? And do you think he was already kind of top of mind when they were going through this process in expectation that a candidate would be in the Super Bowl by the by just Chris Ballard mentioning, you know, this could go into mid to late February or whatever it was? Yeah, that's a good question. Really good. Yeah, I mean, to your point, Yes. Um, Obviously, Josh McDaniels was in the Super Bowl back in 2018, so I think that is worth repeating. I mean, if you look at the final four teams, Eddie, uh, D'Amico Ryans, Brian Callahan, you know, two losers in the title game, both were on the Colts list. And, you know, in Callahan's case, I think he still should be and is a realistic candidate. Uh, Obviously, Shane Steichen and Eric Bieniemy playing in the Super or coaching in the Super Bowl. So, yes, I, I do think that is an element to it. I guess I will say this on the whole favorite thought. It's Wednesday at 10 a.m. The Colts have been steel trap-like, particularly from the Ballard side of things, and not wanting anything to get out. Uh, you know, I was texting a little bit with Chris Hagan. For those that don't know Chris, Chris works for um, the Fox Television here in Indianapolis. He's out at the Super Bowl, and he caught up with Shane Steichen on Super Bowl media night, and basically Chris said to me that Steichen was a bit startled when he heard that Chris Hagan was from Indianapolis, said that he was polite, but wanted to reiterate numerous times that um, my focus for this week is on Sunday, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if, I, if you handed me $10, Eddie Garrison, and said, Kevin, lay this on $10 for a coach Wednesday morning at 10 a.m., I'd probably put that on Steichen. Again, I don't view him as some overwhelming favorite. You will hear me. And I will make my own case, I think, for some of these candidates. But I think part of the reason, like if we get to Friday, Eddie, yeah. and I haven't heard any leak, that means that both sides of the equation want to be very close, closed off. Ballard, of course, wants to be closed off. And in Steichen's camp, if you're his agent, I mean, this dude's calling the plays in the Super Bowl. It's a big bleeping deal on Sunday. Worth like, noting, Ballard and Steichen share the same agent. I was curious about that. Bienemy doesn't, right? Bienemy doesn't. I, I, I believe I it was that Callahan, Steichen, Bubba Ventrone. There was an, another one on that list, too. I, okay. I can't I, remember who it was. I, I looked that up earlier in the week to make sure that I thought Bienemy didn't because, you know, okay, you know, would you have leaks from either side? And again, from, the, from, from that point, it's a great point you bring up, Eddie, that. Um, you obviously want to appease both of your clients in this yeah. situation, and they are under the same umbrella. But even if you're just talking about Shane Steichen's personal, you know, job that he has to do on Sunday night, that's a big, big thing. So you don't want to put too much pressure, have his phone blowing up, or whatever. Uh, so I do think if we get to like Friday and you haven't heard any leak on that side, I could certainly see it being Steichen, but. Again, I think you can make some cases. And I have heard some other candidates that aren't necessarily, I think, the frontline candidates. I've heard that they've interviewed really, really well, and they've made strong impressions on the Colts staff. Um, lastly, before we get into the pros and cons, Eddie, I will say my one disappointment in this taking as long as it has, and again, some of this is out of your control if you want a Super Bowl coach, but I do think you miss out on the type of staff you can build. And if you look at Carolina... Carolina and hiring Frank Reich and Ajero Evero as their defensive coordinator, they hired two guys they interviewed to be head coach. That's a great coup by them. Great work by them. Dave yeah. Tepper has a lot of money. He, I can totally understand why Dave Tepper was able to make this work. That is something I thought the Colts could do. With all these candidates, could you hire two of them? And I think when you wait as long as you have, do you miss out on that opportunity? And in general, do you miss out on staff members? Yep. I think that is the one real concern that you have with this process. But as I've said all along, you guys have heard me say it, I have little issue with the Colts being as patient as they have. Did you miss out on a little senior bowl scouting? Sure. You have the fourth overall pick. I, I get the senior bowl is more than just the fourth overall pick, but 
it, to me, it's not the end of the world. The fourth overall pick was not at the Senior Bowl. You know, it's not like those guys are there. Uh, the combines here in a few weeks. You're gonna have to, you know, you're gonna have to get to work right away. But you'll start the offseason program just like everyone else will that have, that's hired a new coach. You'll start on April 3rd, two weeks before every other team in the league. That's the NFL rule. When you have a new coach, you're able to start your offseason program a little bit earlier. So from that point, it's not like your players can get to work with the staff any earlier than others. Um, so, yeah. Do you got anything else? Throw it at me. If not, let's get into uh, the candidates. All right, your first candidate on your pros and cons list. The interim coach, Jeff Saturday. Eddie, the biggest pro is he has watched and seen and witnessed the inner workings of your organization for two months. So he has gotten an unbelievable look behind the scenes at what he feels like he needs to change. Like, he's taken inventory. And that's a huge advantage that I think Saturday has. Obviously, um, I don't know how much of a pro some people will look at it, but the owner is obsessed with him. Um, If you look at the cons... He's never coached above the high school level outside of the worst interim run, one of the worst interim runs you'll ever see. Um, I, I'd have some concern about just what that staff would look like considering the lack of NFL experience as well. Um, so again, this is the one that falls in the, I would not fully understand it. I, I, I try to point out some reasons why. I view it as a pro, and the inventory is probably the one thing. But outside of that, and a guy that would demand significant change, I can't give you much more than that. Yeah, I can't either. I mean, uh, our friend and colleague, JMV, says that he's had somebody tell him, and he's ran this on the air, that Saturday isn't in the running. That it's not him. He's not one of the finalists anymore. Yeah, I I think I've said on this podcast for the last couple of weeks now, I, I do not believe Jeff Saturday will be hired. Um, again, it's Jim Mersey, but I am of that belief. I don't know if, to JMV's point, you know, I, I don't know if he's been informed of that or where it's at, but I would be surprised if Jeff Saturday was the new or permanent Colts head coach. That's good news for you and Jake. Kind of a regular Monday guest back. Well, I. <laughs> Little birdie. I don't know if Jeff's the biggest fan of myself or Jake, but yeah, we'll oh, have to try and really mend, mend some relationships here in the offseason. And you know what? I can't really say I fault the guy too much. You know, when you are critical of a human um, and critical of the job that they're doing, I get it. It's part of the business, but uh, I'd rather be honest than try and uh, hold everybody's hand. Uh, Raheem Morris is up next. I think there's a lot of pros and some cons here with him, too. Yeah, I think there's a lot of pros. Again, he's the only one on the list, Eddie, with real NFL head coaching experience. His words are pretty impressive when you hear his perspective on that first head coaching gig. He's 32 years old when he took that job. I think he's learned a whole lot from that. I would say one of the strongest things he has as a defensive candidate, Eddie, is he coached for three years offensively with Kyle Shanahan. And he was obviously on Shanahan's staff in Atlanta. And by that, I mean Shanahan is the OC and Morris was the wide receivers coach. And then most recently, he's been with Sean McVay for a couple seasons, several seasons. Those are two pretty good offensive minds to be around. So I think that would be a pro. The con, and again, this is going to be for every defensive candidate, but it does come with the what is your offensive plan and what is the ability to sustain that plan if – things go awry one way or the other uh, that would be the con there i don't you know i know some people are like retreads or cons I, I, i'm not one of those people i mean you're gonna see a retread coach in the super bowl um you know you saw doug peterson still still around in the playoffs as well um i, I don't have that as much of a con but i know some people would would say that I think the surprise candidate that has made it this far that we always talk about is there's always one, Don, a.k.a. Wink of Martindale. Bruce Arians, Eddie. Bruce Arians vibes. And you say Bruce Arians vibes, Jim Irsay is going to get excited. It's going to percolate a little bit. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, we'll probably stop there. And Chris Ballard is even going to get excited. I know Ballard's tenure here obviously didn't overlap with Arians, but... Arians is a guy that it's hard not to like. I mean, he's he's a football guy. Think of the stereotypes and and all of that. But I really think Ursay would like him. And I go back to the Jeff Saturday. I mean, Jeff Saturday's been pretty blunt, pretty honest. Significant change needs to happen. 
public accountability was never an issue for Bruce Arians. So that is what you'd be getting. You'd be getting a stark contrast from Frank Reich. And I think those are the things worth mentioning with that. You know, his defensive style, Eddie, very aggressive, very attacking. I think his personality can be like that as a coach as well. You know, I remember talking with somebody within the Giants organization, and the first word they said is juice. You know, the high energy, also a great teacher, so it's not just this intense rah-rah. It's a guy that also can sit down and teach. And you know what? He was with John Harbaugh for quite a while. I think John Harbaugh has done a very good job as a head coach in the NFL. So what would you be learning from him? The con, if I'm not mistaken, first-time head coach at any level. Yeah. Any level. So there's obviously some pressures there that are a little bit different. Um, And, you know, of course he coaches on the side of the ball where the recent trend is not that. The leader of men, Rich Basaccia. That phrase, it gets made fun of a lot. I understand people are tired of it. Go back to the Jim Irsay quote in November. The number one trait I'm looking for in a head coach is leadership. That phrase that you just used, Eddie, leader of men, it means a whole lot to Bauer and Irsay. And it means a whole lot to, I think, a lot of people in the NFL. Um, Rich Passaccia, the pros there would be the leader. Um, He's been an assistant head coach and a special teams coordinator pretty much for two decades. And for those that aren't familiar, those are some big responsibilities in the sense of you you have more of a 1-53 to grasp than just your O coordinator or just your D coordinator. Yeah. So I think those are some of the reasons. Think of what you want about Aaron Rodgers, but, I mean, Aaron Rodgers, did you hear him on McAfee talk about Rich Bisaccia? I mean, just glowing remarks on Bisaccia about, the type of leader, what he what he witnessed, and this is Rich in Green Bay for one year. It's not like he was in Green Bay for a long, long time, and it's not like the Packers went to the Super Bowl. Right. I mean, they didn't even make the playoffs, and this guy has had that sort of connection on a guy that's been in the league for quite some time. If you don't want to go with the Rodgers side of view or point of view, just look what he did with the Raiders last year, or two years ago. Um, and the reason that I bring that up the seven and five interim stint, the great finish to end the year. Think about the connection on that Raider staff and what the Colts have in their own building. Gus Bradley on the Raider staff, and the guy that really matters for Chris Ballard is Rod Marinelli, longtime NFL assistant, huge confidant of Chris Ballard. Pretty much the reason, one of the major reasons, I should say, Matt Eberflus was chosen as a defensive coordinator in 2018. So Marinelli on that Raiders staff saw firsthand what and how Rich Bisaccia operated so he would have a great sense of who he is and how he leads. The con, why is this guy at the age of 62 never been a head coach? Yeah. That's a fair question to ask. And when you do hire the special teams coordinator, and honestly, John Harbaugh has felt a lot of this in Baltimore, Eddie, you frequently have staff changes offensively and defensively. So the continuity on both sides of those ball, both sides of the ball, how do you s- sustain that? Yeah, you know, I, offensive continuity is one thing, but defensively, if Gus Bradley's not retained, then you're looking at a third defensive coordinator in three years. So those would be some of the questions you would have with with Rich. I would say based off of some of the latest reporting regarding Gus Bradley, I'd say it's about a 75-25 that he's returning. The three candidates that I keep on coming back to with Gus Bradley, Raheem Morris, there's a connection there. Basaccia, definitely a connection there. And then Shane Steichen. Yep. You know, Steichen... It's worth pointing out that not only were they together with the Chargers for, I think, four total seasons, that 2020 season, it was Steichen's offense versus Bradley's defense every day during practice. So that's a, that's a close relationship you're going to have with the coordinator. You're going back and forth on things you want to do in practice, how you want to script things, hey, give us this look, give us that look. Um, now, if Shane Steichen doesn't want Gus Bradley, or you know, maybe that's a reflection on you know, how things went for the Chargers, but I do think that's a connection that if I'm looking at these seven names and who would like Gus Bradley, there's three I point to pretty quickly. Yeah. Morris, Pisaccia, and Steichen. 
talk about a segue going right into Shane Steichen. That was beautiful. That was good teamwork. Yeah. We need to edit a that plus. out and send that to our boss. Um, we need it for Marconi, right? Sure, sure, yeah. We'll definitely take some hard away if we can. Um, the appeal for Steichen, I think, has to be in the quarterback background and mainly the variety of those quarterbacks. Philip Rivers is position coach. Justin Herbert as a one-year coordinator, and then Jalen Hurts the last couple of seasons. Eddie, those are different style quarterbacks. Yep. Those are different ages of quarterbacks. Offenses look different with those three. Um, That's not just the cookie cutter. If you look at Brian Callahan and you really want to nitpick, his quarterback history is mostly with similar style QBs. Mostly pocket passers. C.J. Stroud. Exactly. C.J. Stroud would certainly fit fit that mold. You look at Steichen, it's a little bit of everything. Um, By all accounts, him and and Phillip Rivers remain close. Football close. I would venture to guess Phillip Rivers is not hanging out with you as a football mind if you aren't stupid bright. I mean, just crazy. So, Dad, gummy. I th- yeah, exactly. I think you're going to get that vibe with with Steichen. You can debate the whole just play calling matter or not. I like to point it out, Eddie. Again, I don't think it's like a must requirement, but I like to point it out as if you're calling plays in the NFL, that is a lot of pressure on you. Yeah. And especially got, for a team like Philly, one thousand percent in that city and that quarterback and the offensive head coach is giving you this responsibility, kind of halfway through year one, all of those things. That is pressure that when you're the head coach, you're going to feel some of those same feelings, if not more of them. So I guess what I'm getting at is, I could be totally wrong on this, but if you were to hook up some sort of you know, pressure meter to Shane Steichen on game days versus Brian Callahan on game days, I would venture to guess Shane Steichen feels a little bit more than, than Callahan. Again, I don't want to like undermine that you know Callahan doesn't feel pressure like the, that that'd be ludicrous but when you get in the press conferences the next week Eddie Zach Taylor and Joe Burrow answer to more of those questions if you're writing a story you want to hear from Burrow and Taylor about offensive issues before you want to hear from Callahan yeah if you are in Philly you probably want to hear from obviously Sirianni matters but Steichen would be very high on that list considering he's a play caller yeah um so again pros the variety of quarterback background what he has to feel as a play caller, the cons. Do you look at Philly's success and how much of it do you just put on Sirianni and Hurts? Yeah. You know, by all accounts, Sirianni is still the main game planner, and it's kind of Steichen just picking off of that game plan. You know, is that a question? Do you ever get a point here, Eddie? And this might be far fetched, but he is 37 years old and he's a first time head coach. Do you get a point in time where some adversity hits him here in Indy and all of a sudden he's like, man, is this what Frank Reich felt? A guy that I coached for? Is this what Nick Sirianni kind of warned me about when I came here? Again, I don't think Sirianni and Frank Reich would give demeaning or you know merits or bad remarks about Indy that much, but they certainly are going to point out, hey man, watch out for this or know this. Like that is something that I feel like is worthy to point out. Do you think Sirianni would get in the way? No, I don't. I I think in the way is too aggressive of a statement. I I, I think Sirianni would. I think the Nick Sirianni we saw post game in early November is a man who is fiery. Yeah, really fiery, and also loves Frank Reich, and that's purely what it was he yelled at fans because in that moment they were the closest people by him and he wanted to associate them with Jim Mersey and in the heat of the moment that's how Nick Sirianni reacted and if you played beer pong against Nick Sirianni and you lost he'd probably get in your face (laughs) that's just who he is and how he's wired I think he can sit back and realize there are a lot of positives about Indianapolis there are a lot of positives about Chris Ballard and, and the collaboration of working with him and so I think Sirianni would take a mature approach to it. I I tweeted out after the Eagles won the NFC Championship game, like, Sirianni, I think he's a good dude. 
and boy, I definitely had some Colts fans being like, he's an amateur prick. And and again, I I watched the same videos you watched of him, and hell, I was in the stadium that day and how he acted. I get what he looked like. That's a competitor. Was it a, a tad immature? Sure. But you know what? I think the Colts missed a whole lot of that Nick Sirianni fire in the last few years. I thought a mistake that Frank Reich made was hiring a very similar arguably lukewarm type of personality in Marcus Brady to replace Nick Sirianni. Might be harsh, but that's those are my thoughts. Uh, we had Michael Lombardi on the Midday Show yesterday, on Tuesday. You know, former NFL front office exec for 25-plus sure. years. He said some interesting things over the years. Yeah, and uh, he said that the first uh, thing that he noticed when it started to really go downhill was Gooch. That's when it. That's when the Colts' downturn really started. When, because when Gooch left, the offensive line physicality yeah. kind of Dave De Guglielmo. If I'm saying that right, I think I threw in an extra syllable there in the middle. Apologies, uh, Gooch. You know, I had someone mentioned to me the other day, like how much was it Howard Mudd and his leave? You know, remember when Howard Mudd left? You know, he, he came back as kind of a consultant and then yeah. left and. Yeah, I looked that up. That was kind of the start of 2019. I really think it was a combination of two things more than any. I think it was the retirement of Anthony Costanzo, not having you went from instead of going from A to C plus at tackle, you went from A to like D minus. Yeah. I think that, and I think Ryan Kelly's just slow downturn and not getting the return on investment with him. I'd point to those two. More than Gouge. I, I understand that, you know, he probably brought a fire or whatever. You know, the O line was pretty good in 2020, and Gouge was nowhere to be found. Obviously, Rivers, I think, helped getting the ball out quick, but I think Costanzo's presence still. And then I just felt like that kind of slow downturn is what I would point to more. Uh, now we're going to transition back to our pros and cons. The name that you just threw around when you were talking about Shane Steichen in comparison here was Brian Callahan. Well, Eddie, as listeners know, I mean, Callahan and D'Amico Ryans, for me, they've been the two names that I've talked about the most since November. I think you go back and look at the list that I put out there then. Steichen, I believe, is also on that list. But, you know, for me, Callahan and Ryans have been the two. The pros are an absurd quarterback resume of Peyton Manning, Matthew Stafford and Derek Carr as position coaches, and then most recently with Burrow. Um, I think it's a big pro that he's the son of Bill Callahan. And I don't think it's nepotism, Eddie. I think it's a, you have lived the life of being the son of an NFL head coach, so you get what happens. You get the pressure. You get the responsibilities. You get what lifestyle is like at home. Um, Look at Brian Callahan's resume. It's not like he just followed Bill Callahan around wherever he coached. No, I mean, there's not a lot of overlap between those two in the coaching ranks. Um, When I look at the quarterbacks, too, I think it's less about development, Eddie, and it's more about, like, what did you learn as a sponge from those guys? Yeah. What did you take from Stafford? What did you take from Carr? It's not like they consistently won in all those places. How did you learn about how that quarterback handled things? You know, is there something from Stafford you would want to take? Um, You know, Stafford is a different style quarterback than Carr, you know, in terms of arm strength and things like that. Um, and then, of course, Burrow, he's certainly been much more a part of that development. I also think a pro with Callahan is, given the Cincinnati personnel, offensively, Eddie, I think he'd be more demanding of the need to get some of that personnel here in Indy. Easier said than done, but I've said this before. I think a knock on Frank Reich is he, and I think I made this analogy last week, so apologies on that. I think Frank Reich wa- walks into a kitchen at an Airbnb, opens up the cabinets, and says... We got what we need right here. Cool. We don't need to go to Costco. We, we don't need to go. Hey, the VP down the street, we don't need it. We got everything that we need. Callahan's going to walk in there and say, <laughs> Dude, did you see what we had in Cincinnati? You need that. And so, again, easier said than done. But I think he would have the resume and the history of be a little bit more demanding of the person. Hell, look at the Denver Super Bowl teams. And they had a ton of offensive talent yeah. around Peyton in those years. Cons, you can look out at the other side of it. He is coordinating an offense with littered with talent. How much of that is him? How much of that is the talent? How much of that is Zach Taylor? Those would be some of the questions that you have. 
and similar to Steichen, at the end of the day, it still is a young head coach getting a young coach getting his first crack at it. Final candidate, I think this is another surprise that he's in it this long. Aaron Glenn. Yeah, and I, you know, I've I've heard that Glenn, you know, left a pretty good impression on Indianapolis. I think when you look at Glenn. There's a bit of some Mike Vrabel vibes. The resume is rather unique with Aaron Glenn. You know, I remember him as a pretty good player, Eddie. He also was an NFL scout. That was his first post-playing career entry into the NFL. A personnel scout with the Jets for a couple of years, and then of course is coached. That's a you don't see that trifecta. No high-level player, scout, and coach. That's pretty rare. Um, Upper quartile, the upper quartile. Thank you. You took the words right out of my mouth. I appreciate you. Rare air. Throwing that in there. Um, you talk to people around Detroit, you hear the words blunt, you hear the words aggressive. I get some Mike Vrabel type vibes with Aaron Glenn. And you know what? You look at the Mike Vrabel resume, Eddie. He coached the NFL for four years before he became the head coach of the Titans. Only one of those four was as a coordinator. Aaron Glenn's got kind of a similar resume. Honestly, he's got more years in the NFL, but he's only been one year as a coordinator in Detroit. You look at Detroit's defense from last year in the basement of a lot of categories. Not, I mean, compared to Ben Johnson as their offense coordinator, there's not a light, a lot to like about their defensive rankings. If you look a little bit more into the weeds of it, they allowed, I think it's at least 24 points, Eddie, in each of the first seven games. In the final 10, I think there was a bye week thrown in there. The final 10, they allowed 24 more in only three of those 10. So you saw improvement. Uh, at one point, they were starting four rookies on that side of the ball as well. And I think their defense, just getting back to acceptable, was a big reason why they went on that surge late in the season. Uh, the cons... This is a dude that has only been a coordinator for one season. Chuck Pagano was only a coordinator for one season. So you can go both sides of the fence with, again, will it be overwhelming for these guys? And again, I could throw this con in for every single defensive candidate. What's your plan on offense, and how are you going to sustain that that plan? Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are some pros and cons. If Gus Bradley is retained here, I want to get this in. Do you think that's, that would have an impact on Brandon Faison returning, uh, Yannick Ngakwe returning, yeah. Bobby O returning? I, I just think Okereke is gone. I, I don't know how you can pay linebackers that much money all here. I, I bring back EJ Speed and don't bring back Bobby. Um, I And that's no knock on Okereke. It's more of just, again, how you've spent and considering with – the Leonard situation, I don't think how you can move on from that. So, Ngakwe would be the name that obviously you would look at, and that would be the one. Um, I do think it would have some impact there. And obviously the more of the pro bring him back. Ngakwe, I I can listen to both sides of it. I I can really listen to both sides of it. I think one thing on Gus that, and and I don't think the Colts are doing this, but I do not want to see them force Gus Bradley on any head coach. Gus Bradley had a nice year here. Pretty good year. Um, there are some things that I'm like, ah, I'd like to see a little bit more out of this, and I don't love just the lack of aggression, the lack of variety, but pretty good year. Yeah. But, you know, I just, I always thought the Reich Eberflus thing was just, just a tad awkward. How, and again, I know that was a different situation, how he had some assistance kind of forced upon him. I think you need to let the head coach be the head coach, hire the people he wants to hire, coordinate, like mind, not like minded. All those things. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, Eddie, you do have a little bit of like, run back to who you know. Run back to what you know. And if you're a defensive player and the head coach says something you don't like, do you run to Gus and say, gosh, it wasn't like that with with Frank. Good or bad. Mm -hmm. I don't want that behind the scenes. I, I, I don't want the whispering. I want everybody on the same page. And again... If, if you really like us, Bradley, and you're Rich Passaccia, or you're Raheem Morris, or you're Shane Steichen, and you've got history with them, totally good with it. But I don't want to see that forced upon anybody. And again, I don't think it is being forced, but I just want to make that clear. Ready for Twitter questions now? Yes, let's do them. Uh, Brett is up first. What's your preferred Colts head coach and quarterback pairing from this list? 
Shane Steichen and C.J. Stroud, Woo. Raheem Morris and Will Levis, Woo. Brian Callahan and Bryce Young. Ooh. Pair up the Bryans. I like that. How about this from Brett? It's pretty good. Eddie, should I be worried about Bryce Young's height? Yes. Okay. I I, I, I should be. I think he's shorter than Kyler Murray. Does Kyler get a lot of balls batted down? I don't know because he scrambles a lot. So do you worry more about height or more about durability? Ooh. For a player of that stature. Because, you know, by all accounts, Murray's pretty, you know, pretty thick. Plus he's more mobile and more willing to be mobile. I would say durability. Man, I, I, you know, I'm usually one that takes those things into consideration, I think, more than most. But, boy, I just have, I've got a little bit of an infatuation with the type of plays that Bryce Young can make. I think he's the best, I think he's the best combination of passer and creator of all the quarterbacks. I can hear an argument that Stroud might be a better passer. I think Bryce Young can hang with them big time in that area. You know, Syke and Morris Callahan, I've got less of a debate about. I can probably get along with just about any of them. Callahan has been the one that I've talked about more than others, so I will go with the Callahan Young combo. I assume you'll go with the S's. Yeah, you know I'm a big I'm a uh-huh. big Stroud guy. And again, I I, I want to be clear what CJ Stroud showed me in the semifinal. Whew, whew. We had just gotten back from a Florida vacation. Maddie was just, I mean, she didn't make it past 8 p.m. That game started around 8, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I was pouring coffee at 5 p.m. <laughs> By the way, I don't know if coffee works. I don't think so. I don't know if it works. I haven't taken coffee. I haven't drank coffee. The uh, Taking coffee, act like it's a drug. Well, I guess it is a drug. I haven't done coffee the first two days of this week. My throat was a little um, scratchy, itchy, and I just wanted tea in the morning. Yeah. Try and act like I'm some real broadcaster here. Uh, and I've been fine the rest of the day. Is coffee a myth? I don't think so. I saw Andy Reid mention earlier today that he's got enough uh, energy for a chubby guy. He doesn't need coffee. <laughs> I love Andy Reid. Right. We need more Andy Reeds. Uh, and coffee's expensive, man. Yeah. I mean, it can add up. It's Granted, one of those... I don't. I I can't even taste it. I'm just like, just give me the worst looking cake up and move on. It's like it's one of those things. It's like you know, it's. I go to Starbucks and I get black coffee. Seven, eight dollars, but like it adds up over time. I, I read something that it's more so about the amount of sleep you get and not the coffee. Like if you get the right amount of sleep, then you don't need the coffee. Okay. I can I can hear you. I, I think I think the, the coffee thing is more so if you don't get the proper amount of sleep and there's also studies out there that say you're supposed to wait like an hour before you should consume coffee to determine if you need it or not. Right. And you're supposed to drink kind of a full glass of water before you start the day. Yeah. But nobody does that. Hey, listeners, just be glad we're not talking golf as we golf on a tangent. Okay, That's um, true. throw me the next one, Eddie. Uh, Zach is next. Hey, Kevin, question for the pod. Do you think this extended coaching search will have a negative impact on scouting? Balor loves his senior bowl, but this year he's still deep in coaching search. Very fair question from from Zach. The Colts had personnel down at the senior bowl. I would assume Chris Ballard and Ed Dodds did not spend much, if any time, down there. I don't know that for a fact, but that is my assumption considering... They had a lot of coaching interviews this time last week when the bulk of the Senior Bowl stuff's going on. You yeah. know, practices matter more than the games down there. I wonder if they sent Morocco Brown down there. Yeah, again, I would assume your entire scouting department. You know, in my opinion, Eddie, some sort of coaching. Who is doing the interviewing? I would say it's a combination of these people. Brian Decker, the personality person. Uh, his title's much more sophisticated than that. That sounded like I was undermining him. Ed Dodds, Chris Ballard, Carly Ursay. Jim Ursay, maybe Kalen Ursay, Pete Ward, probably a member or two of their legal slash HR um, slash PR group. Obviously, when you have Zooms, you can have a lot more people watching the Zooms, etc. But I would guess in person, it would be some contingent looking like that makeup. So, to your point, Morocco Brown, who you know heads up your scouting department, really, and the college group of Anthony Coughlin and some of those other guys, I mean, yeah, I, I'd assume they all were down at the Senior Bowl. And, you know, as far as you know, deep in the sky, it is a, it's an important piece to the process. Um, but I think, like, you just kind of got away sacrifices to it. 
And to your earlier point, Eddie, if you want to coach in the Super Bowl, you were restricted on when and how you can interview those yeah. guys. So that's just part of the process. I, I don't think I'll look back on this 2022 draft and the 20 excuse me, the 2023 draft will largely be judged on what happens at number four. Yeah. And that guy was not at the senior bowl. No. So will it hurt second, third, fourth rounders? Maybe a little bit, but you know what? That'll give more voices to some of those lower level scouts. And good for them. And Chris Boward should and will, I think, listen to him. Good morning, Kevin. Just got done listening to Kevin and Query. Love your work. Oh, uh, Dallas you. Clark wants to know, D'Amico. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, geez. I was going to say here, we've had Dallas on before. Uh, this is Dallas, though, okay. but not Dallas Clark. Dallas, uh, thank you for that. With D'Amico Ryan's seemingly heading to Houston, officially heading to Houston now, what would your ideal coaching staff be? with the remaining candidates. We all want to develop the young quarterback. Would Raheem Morris be able to bring a star-studded cast with all his connections from various coaching experiences, or do you prefer what Callahan and Steichen have done with their young quarterbacks from Canada? Canada. Dallas. I like that. Who do you think uh, Dallas's favorite CFL team is? I don't even know any of the CFL teams. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders, if that's still their name. I mean, I should know one simply because a Decatur High School graduate like myself. Oh, uh, Tommy Stevens is in the CFL. Look at that! What what, what position is he playing? Because he, you know, quarterback. He, a variety of things. Is he still a quarterback? Yeah. Uh, Penn State product, correct? And uh, Miss, Mississippi State too. Mississippi State. I forgot about that. Okay. Um. All right. Dallas wants to know, like, what would be the what would be. Uh, first, he wanted ideal? to know, yeah, your ideal yeah. coaching staff, um, and then do you think Raheem Morris would be able to uh, bring in a star-studded cast? Yeah, I, you know, I, again, I I don't know about star-studded cast. I think there was kind of a bit of a missed opportunity there, and um, the ability to kind of have that, you know, potent potent staff. Um, but having said that, I sighed a little bit more offensively again I'm not like it, it it has to be that or it's nobody but that's where I kind of side on that front um, you know we mentioned it before if you could pair and Evero was the one that really stood out because he was no longer or it seemed like Denver would let him be released I don't know if we're there with anybody else like Eric Bieniemy, if I'm not mistaken Eddie after last year he was a free agent yeah, I, I don't know if that contract in Kansas City was for multiple years or what, uh, but that would be something that you would have to consider. So I prefer Callahan Steichen with the young quarterbacks. It's just you have to get that right. And hell, you could make the argument, Eddie. Mike Vrabel's fighting some of that in Tennessee right now. Yeah, He's had some turnover at offensive coordinator. They obviously haven't spent a super high pick, but they've had some turnover there. Tim Morris. Is that their new OC? Elevated uh, from past game coordinator, is that was his name? Say Tim Kelly, maybe. Tim Kelly, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh-huh. That would be more accurate. Yeah. Tim Morris, yep. He's your seventh grade basketball coach at Decatur Central. Sounds like it at least. <laughs> <laughs> uh Donner or Daner? Which way are we going with this? Here? I think Daner. All right, Daner. We're from I, Indiana. Go with Daner. <laughs> save, save Donner for the uh, for Christmas night. Uh, I, <laughs> I know we're a ways away from draft season, but with the latest Bears news saying, "quote They want to trade the number one pick." Could you touch on the thought process of "I'm not in the business of waiting for a quarterback"? If you love a guy, go get him. But we never hear the discourse of what happens when you trade up for a guy and end up with, in recent years, Robert Griffin III, Jared Goff, Carson Wentz, Mitch Trubisky, Sam Darnold, Justin Fields, and Trey Lance. Some of these guys are okay, but enough for draft for future draft capital. For every Mahomes and Josh Allen, there are many examples of maybe not busts, but certainly not high-level play of these unicorns. This is a terrific question. Terrific question. If it was this easy, man, everybody would be doing it. Yep. And everybody would have the answer. Um, I always laugh at, like, why do NFL teams screw up the hiring of head coaches? Well, there's 32 of them. Not all 32 can win. 
That's like competition. <laughs> like it's just how it works. So inevitably you're gonna have some of this. Um a Trevor question by Daner. And I have said this numerous times. That's like asking why can you not beat Tiger Woods? Hey. Amen. But maybe in the video game. Um It's probably a phrase I've said more than any other on this podcast. Going down this path that I have certainly preached and wanted to see for years of finding a quarterback in the draft, high in the draft, it is not the easiest path to go down, but it's the path you have to go down if you want sustained success. You have to go down that path. You've got to try. You've got to get the bat. We all were there at one point in our lives. We don't want to swing at the pitch. You got to get the bat off your shoulder. Yeah. And you can't just slap it to right field. You've got to try and get one to left. Well, I guess I'm speaking like everyone's a right hander. You've got to try and get a double or a triple out of it, preferably, of course, a home run. I think, I know a lot of people have various opinions on Jim Ursay right now, and understandably so. A comment that Ursay's made quite often that a lot of people poke fun at, that I don't poke fun at, and I couldn't agree more with him is he has mentioned something along the lines of he wants multiple Super Bowls within a decade. Yeah. And again, when you're a team that hasn't won a division in eight years and 20-some teams in the NFL have won a division since you last have, I get why people might say, you know, crawl before you walk. But that is Jim Mercer's goal as a franchise. Can you imagine, Eddie, being the Philadelphia Eagles right now and witnessing a couple Super Bowl runs in this type of span? Obviously, Kansas City speaks for itself. But, like... To have multiple runs, and I and with two totally different rosters. Yeah, I mean, the Eagles. It's it's crazy how they've done it. But if you are going to have multiple Super Bowls in a decade, you're likely making other deep playoff runs. What yeah. an awesome feeling for a fan! I mean, isn't that what you want? Your team playing deep in the postseason, anticip- anticipatory moments, home playoff games, you know, parades, all of those things. San Francisco without the rings, as of late. At least they're getting some taste of it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's, I think it is a great goal that Jim Mercer has, but it's a goal that you are never getting if you want to go stop gap, stop gap, stop gap. Never going to get there, particularly with the stop gap choices that they have gone with. Yeah. But you're just not going to get there. Um, I mean, hell, look at, look at the Rams. You'd argue they are in huge scramble mode after their one Super Bowl. The Bucks, they're in big scramble mode. Um, so again, I understand there are certainly misses, but you have to try. If you don't try, you are creating a lower ceiling for your franchise than the other teams that have tried. Yeah. And if you look at the AFC right now, all all seven quarterbacks correct. Twenty seven years or younger in the playoffs this year. Yeah. If you look at the division, or excuse, excuse me, if you look at the conference and how it played out all year long, the top half of the conference, everybody was a first-round pick at quarterback, pretty much. Everybody was typically drafted in like the top 15 of those drafts as well. And outside of like Tannehill, a lot of them were of the age of 27 or younger. So it's an arms race in a loaded conference right now, and you're not running the race like everybody else is running it. You've got to try and run it in that way. Again, not the easiest path. But it's a path you have to go down if you want to give yourself a chance at sustained success. Look at the path that you've gone down for the last few years. And where's that got you? Yeah. That to me should tell you everything. Fine question. Totally there are misses. You could also argue, you know, he, he points out here Goff and Wentz. To be fair, those teams got at the Super Bowl. With Goff and Wentz. Yeah. I get that Carson Wentz wasn't the quarterback for that, but he led them to the number one overall seed that year and it was a huge reason why Philadelphia got to it. Of course, Goff got to the Super Bowl with the Rams and they lose to the Patriots there. So I don't, even those teams, it's just, it's the benefit of the rookie contract too. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, Eddie, this is like, I forget how far you go back. I think it's at least five years. I think it's much longer than that. That will have a rookie contract quarterback in the Super Bowl. At least one. Um, was Mahomes on his rookie deal when he faced Brady in Tampa? I I, I would venture to guess yes. Um, obviously Burrow and yeah, Stafford. Let me, let me see how great our Wi-Fi is in the studio. Going back to it. Um, okay, so obviously this year you have Hurts, you've got Burrow. 
Um, I, I believe, because Mahomes is a 2017 draft pick, right? And that was the 2020 season. So yeah, he's yeah. still been on the rookie deal. Obviously, you have Mahomes the year before. You've got Goff the year before that. You have Wentz if you want to slot him in. I mean, he was a starter for the vast majority of that season. I think you would go back to 2016, Matt Ryan and Tom Brady. Wow. That's seven is, years ago. Is where you would go. So I, this is the route to me that you have to go down. Uh, side question here, talking about the Super Bowl. You think Chris Ballard, whenever he hears the national media or sometimes locally talk about oh, Philly's got this great offensive line, defensive line, he goes, oh, i got to clip that, got to send it to Jim. <laughs> See, Jim, we can do it this way. Yeah. Damn it. You know, they, they, they certainly are stout there, but I think they've invested heavily into the quarterback position knowing that they needed to get there. You know, And the skill position. Mahomes was drafted before they've revamped that whole O-line. You know, in the Super Bowl that you brought up earlier is that Tampa O line. I, I do think, and again, this is something that you Super Bowl wise will we'll, we'll end the show their Super Bowl pick, Eddie. But something I thought Philly did just an incredible job of this year. What did Philly do the week they played the Colts? Went out and got Linval Joseph and Nadama and Sue on a short week after getting dismantled by Washington. Yeah, I, I was going to say embarrassed. Dismantled is the better adjective to use because of what they did on the ground, Washington did. And they said, we have got to find something now. We've got older linemen. We cannot have them playing as much as they are. And they made in-season acquisitions. I want everybody to go out there and find me the in-season acquisitions the Colts made this year to improve their 4-12-1 football team. A new vending machine? I mean, seriously. They did get new food in the press box. So There you go. I guess you go there. I mean... It was, was a joke. It good food? Again, coming from a guy, very, very good food. Coming from a guy in Ballard who preaches to the nth degree, 12 months a year, roster acquisition. Yeah. All right. I saw Philly act on it. I didn't see Indy act on it. Has an in depth book ever been written about what it's like to be a NFL general manager and what goes on during NFL head coaching interviews? This is from John. I am fascinated by it and I would be interested to see if each GM does. Uh, things basically the same or if each GM has a completely different way of interviewing and running a team. This would be interesting for a football nerd like me. Keep up the great work, Kev. And I'm not much of a book guy, so I'd like to say a documentary series. This is me personally saying this. John, I, I would eat it up. Documentary to you, Eddie, or, yeah. or book. Um, I just don't I, have the time to sit there and read a book yeah, anymore. I, I, I'm not going to act like I'm some huge, huge book guy. I do try and read a little bit here, but um, I couldn't agree more with this. You know, hopefully our show will be able to get the new coach on and or Chris Boward on here in the very near future. I'll have questions that are of more priority than this one, but this is a question that I would love to ask at some point. Okay, break down a head coach interview for me. Yeah, I think the twelve hours is a bit overblown. I think it's a little bit more in like the six to eight ish. And Eddie, I actually thought about this. All right, because you're obviously having meals with various people. Um, again. Uh, you're, I would hope at some point you're showering or you're having to change your clothes. <laughs> you're able to like go back to your wherever you're staying. Hotel. We're sweating this profusely for an interview. Well, never know. Maybe you need a, you know, a little noon workout, something like that. But okay, if you want to break it down to eight hours, one hour on quarterback plan, one hour on free agency, one hour on the draft, one hour on the schedule, how you want to run. The schedule, you know, training camp, practice schedule, et cetera, et cetera, off season program, those things. One hour on your coaching staff. One hour just for background on Jim Ursay, and probably is Ursay talking a whole lot more than than you are. And then one hour on what you think of the Colts roster. So those are eight pretty reasonable topics to me that I know a lot of people are like talking about an hour for that. Remember, there's a handful of people in the room. And then probably situational things, like during a game, too. Yeah, situational is a great point. In-game sort of stuff, yeah, that, that's a topic that you could also throw on there. When you break it down like that, to me, it doesn't sound as ludicrous. Well, now, that's about, what, if you said an hour for each of those things, about eight, nine hours, You, I mean, you're going to have a breaks in between, I'm assuming, sure. so I could sure. see that, I mean, if those breaks add up, depending on how long they are, they yeah. could be 12 hours. So, John... Great questions. Question I have as well. We'll uh, we'll try to get to it at some point. 
Uh, when you sk- discuss Brian Callahan, you point out his lack of play calling. Uh, you also questioned whether or not Frank Reich had too much on his plate on game days with him calling plays. I'm curious, this is from Jason, how you reconcile the two. Yeah, very fair point. I'm glad that Dana earlier and Jason kind of some counter questions is some of the thoughts that I have. Um, to me, the lack of play calling, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about pressure. Can you handle some game day pressure? The responsibility that comes with being an NFL head coach. You know, to me, that's where more of the question I have. You know, I brought up the whole press conference, you know, uh, questions that Cincinnati media and Philadelphia media respectively would throw at those guys. You know, if you're the six o'clock news, there's a good chance that you're going to lead with Burrow and Zach Taylor before you're leading with Zach. Uh, Brian Callahan if you're going to explain offensive issues sort of story so for me it has less to do with what's on your play I'm not saying Brian Callahan needs to come here and be the play caller or Shane Steichen needs to come here and be the play caller yeah I'm saying simply game day pressure chaotic moments how much of it do you feel how much of it have you experienced that to me is more of where the question is I I in no way am I saying because Shane Steichen calls plays, he needs to come here and also be the play caller. No, that would first off, that would of course be, you know, hypocritical of me. And secondly, I just I just don't believe in it. It's more of when you know, kind of shit hits the fan. How do you react to that? I would agree there. Fifty days until opening day. Oh, good. Well, fifty days till the Reds are zero and one. Yeah, I can't wait for the dis- disappointment. Uh, hey, Kev, question for the pod or the morning show. How much of the quarterback plan does Chris Ballard show in these interviews from Dalton? Ooh, I like it. Yeah, it's a good one, Dalton. Uh, now, yeah. is Ballard sharing his plan or are the candidates sharing theirs? Or is it more of like a collaborative discussion? Like, hey, I like uh-huh. this guy. I'll show your cards if you show me your, you know, uh, if, if I'll show mine if you show me yours. Because um, in most of these cases, all of these candidates have franchise quarterbacks already on the teams that they are currently employed by. Yeah, again, I, you know, I just said the quarterback plan should be about an hour of discussion. I, it's a great question. I, I don't think the quarterback plan should be etched in stone because Eddie, when you think about it like this. I mean, unless you're doing something behind the scenes, there's no way Chris Bauer has sat down with Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, Will Levis, any of these guys. No. I believe that would be illegal. Um, the Combine, he could do it. Pro days, you can do it. Now, there there is the... Private workouts. Assistant coach at Kentucky, right? That Yeah, Brad White is the linebacker's you. coach that has an overlap with, with, with Chris Bauer. But directly, you know, you're not yeah. having contact with these guys yet. So, it would be ludicrous for... You know, any of that. And again, we stress leader. If Ballard is spending a top five pick on a quarterback, that dude is going to check the leadership box. And honestly, and this is no knock on any of these three, you hear people talk about what Will Levis played through and how Will Levis handles himself off the field. He checks that leadership box. Yeah. Based off a lot of a, a lot of accounts. So I don't think the Colts know and they shouldn't know exactly what their plan will be at quarterback. You can have intel, you can have a feeling. Obviously, you've watched these guys play. To your point, Eddie, you've talked with people on their staffs, et cetera, et cetera. But you're going to want your GM and your head coach, and hell, maybe even your owner, to talk to these guys. Yeah. I mean, I could totally see Jim Irsay wanting to to do that. So um, I think it's a little bit of like, hey, how are you feeling? Hey, how am I? You know, it sounds like a seventh grade relationship. Yeah, I kind of like you. Hey, yeah, yeah. You want to go to Wendy's? Hey, you know, it, Steak and shake, Kev. Steak and well, shake. I'll tell you what, man. We were at Maddie, myself, and Rosie, and Max. We were at Chick Fil A last night. That place was humming with high school dates. Yeah, that's the new place. Yeah, I, I, and you know what? Good on you. What a great place. Yeah, it's a nice fast food. Great establishment. Nice playscape there. Rosie loved it. Um, <laughs> so I think you're showing a little bit, but I don't think it's etched in stone. V- very good question, Dalton. I love this one from Conroy. Do you think Chris Ballard would be so petty enough to agree to a trade uh, for Derek Carr and then rescind the offer slash agreement just to stick it to Josh McDaniels? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you got Kevin Dynamo. Oh, man, I'm going to lose it. That was good, Conroy. 
Um, Boy, that would be kind of petty. That'd be something. Be. Where's Carr going? Saints? I saw that he had a meeting with them last night, and the report was that Vegas would not let him meet with any teams unless the uh, trade, uh, the, the compensation for one Derek Carr was agreed upon prior to the meeting. Well, it's next week, right, is where he really hits like that big money, February 15th. Yeah, it's like 28, 28, 26 million, somewhere around that. In there. Your car seems like a fine quarterback, seems like a fine dude. Uh, I'm good with it. I, I, I don't want to see Derek Carr playing for the Colts. I, I know this question specifically didn't ask that. Um, it was more of a funny thing there. But uh, Where would you put your money on him playing? I mean, the Jets are a team that's popped into my mind. Um, you got to feel like one of those NFC South teams. Carolina? Yeah, I, I, you know, Carolina sits there at nine, Eddie, and don't they have an additional second from the McCaffrey deal? I'd like to think Carolina would look to move up um, and take a quarterback, but again, they're gonna have to move up. I mean, that's gonna have to have some substance behind it, Eddie. If you look at the NFC South right now, and you look at the quarterbacks under contract, because Winston's a free agent, Donald's yeah. a free agent, Mariota's a free agent, dude, that division sucks a quarterback. Oh, yeah. I mean, the best under con- uh, under contract quarterback in the NFC South is? Uh, Kyle Trask. God. I mean, think about that. That's one of the scariest comments anyone's ever made in the history of the NFL. <laughs> Desmond Ritter? Is P.J. Walker still under contract? Sam Darnold is a free agent, I- right? Is Taysom Hill the best quarterback in the NFC South? I mean, it's just... It's wild. So I, if your car, I would think you'd want Blaine to Blaine Gabbert? Out. God, I mean, oh boy. Super Bowl winner, Blaine Gabbert. Uh, it, that's frightening. I think you want to get out of the AFC. So somewhere in the NFC South. Uh, two questions left. Let's just say Chicago falls in love with Bryce Young or someone else. Would you trade number four overall for Justin Fields? This Ooh. is from Mike. Or do you uh, start fresh and draft a rookie quarterback? I know Ballard was a big Fields guy. I know. He he definitely was. He definitely was. Um, kind of like with Lamar Jackson. We discussed this a couple pods back. I feel like this would kind of accelerate the, I don't want to call it a rebuild, but the retool because he's already been in the league now right. for two years. So you've got two years off that rookie contract. You have to pay him a little sooner. Sure, sure. There there are questions here. I, I, I would do it. For number four? I, I like how Fields is wired, Eddie, and I don't think you have the scar tissue there of other guys that would have this happen to him. Yeah. I don't think it's like as negative as Carson Wentz in Philadelphia and how Wentz would handle that. I think Fields has been a little bit more of a limelight, you know, playing at Ohio State. I, I think he would handle it a little bit better than that. Um, I think I would do it. Could feel, you know, at some point, you know, to your point about Lamar Jackson, Fields is going to have to, you know, become a pocket passer ish. You know, at some point, if this is going to be a franchise guy deep into his 30s, he's not going to be able to move. Like he moved throughout his career. And that dude takes a lot of hits. I mean, simply because that offensive line is treacherous. Sure. sure. Um, I would, um, I think I would do it. I'd probably do it too. Yeah. You, you, you sound a little bit hesitant, though. Yeah. Just because I would prefer the Colts to get, you know, a guy who, I mean, sure, the NFL experience is good to have with Fields, but like get a guy that you can groom into your system and then develop him from day one when he walks through the building and then you know you just have I think it's I don't know that's just the way I would do it not easier but like yeah and I hear you out in year three of the rookie deal you'd obviously pick up the fifth year option so you'd have him you know under pretty decent money I know year five it really skyrockets um, through that but 
I think I would do it, but I understand people having reservations. And he'd be learning a you know relatively new offense. Yeah, theoretically as well. Uh, last one from Patrick. Uh, Chris Ballard hasn't spent large portions of the press conference uh, deflecting questions beyond the draft. Uh, what does this say about how he is positioned within the organization and his autonomy in finding a new head coach? And I think Patrick's been listening uh, to Kevin and Query a little bit because that is a staple in the Jake Query vocabulary. That is. Um, that is, certainly. And you know, some of these questions, I think you're kind of feeling the tone of it later on. We've been hanging on for these for a few weeks. So Patrick obviously referencing the season-ending press conference with Ballard deflecting the draft questions. I, I read very little into it, Patrick. I, I think it's simply the poker game. I mean, hell, I asked him a question about the 2023 draft class at quarterback. I mean, you talk about just a stupid question to ask. You could easily say that was stupid by me. And I, I don't know. Maybe I thought that there was a 6% chance that Ballard might say, yeah, I think there's a lot of franchise QBs in this class. Or, boy, there are some really, you know, dynamic runners, and that's an attribute to our offense that has been missing, and we need to do that. I I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe it was a stupid question on me for that, but that is a question that I felt at that point with not a lot of people asking questions, it was worthy to throw out there, so I threw it out there. But, Patrick, I think if you look back on – past Ballard pressers, I tend to think that is a similar tone and answer you get in a good amount of them draft-related. Draft-related. Agreed. Last thing we have to do, make sure you like, rate, and subscribe on the YouTube channel. Oh, look at that, Eddie. Thank you for doing that. And you can always submit your comments on there, too. Yes, we do look for comments there. Again, DM either of us on Twitter. We happily take your comments dm works a little bit better than just kind of the flow of the tweets during the day I, I, in the week you know yeah i tend to spend spend a little bit more time looking at those just to make sure that we get them into the pod super bowl prediction super bowl prediction eddie garrison would you like to go first no i asked you first gosh you little uh eagles 30 chiefs 20 wow you think it's a 10 point i love that philly d-line I think they come out in waves. I worry about Kansas City's health at wideout. The plan for Kelsey. I mean, can you limit him? Yeah, I'm looking at these prop over unders. Kelsey seven and a half rece- receptions, eighty one and a half yards. If you could sign, if Jonathan Gannon, the D coordinator, could do that, hold him to seven for eighty. I'd say yes, right now. I mean, how many times do you just see Kelsey go ten for one thirty and two touchdowns? Yeah. And again, they got banged up there late at receiver Um, I think it's foolish that I'm betting against Mahomes to this extent but I believe in the Eagles Andy Reid off a bye week too I know Andy Reid Venom I trust me Eddie I know this is stupid Um, this is coming from the dude that thought the Raiders could get to the Super Bowl (laughs) you know I I wasn't going to bring it up well shit I mean I deserve it. I will go there. Some props I like. I do it annually. You have to take the total players to have a pass attempt over. Over two and a half. One trick play. Just one. That's all we need. Attempt the pass. Don't Shit, run Travis it. Travis Kelsey's a former quarterback. Thank you. Any, Noah hell, Gray. Anybody. The punter, the holder, I, whatever. Plus 145. Dallas Goddard. Let's get a little Philly Philly. I'm taking that over. This is one I do like that for one. the math wizards you have to think and crunch on. Total combined yardage of made field goals. Oh, my. Combine the yardage of the made field goals over under 117.5. I'm going under. I think these teams are too aggressive. I'm going under. Total combined yardage of all touchdowns in the game, 88 and a half. That. You like some big plays? Ooh. Take the over. This one I love. Total number the times the chains get brought out for measurement. Over, under, one and a half. Hammer the over. I'm going the under. Chain gang, baby. You need TV moments. Right, where are Bring the odds the on chains. that, by the way? Do you have that readily available? Where are the odds, do you know? Uh, well, it's just uh, over, under. So I, I think it's simply, you know, minus 110, whichever way you want to bet it. Ooh, okay. One and a half there. Will there be a penalty for roughing the passer? I hate to bet this, but there always is. Plus 160. I wish they had it on the quarterback because I would do it on Mahomes and not Jalen Hurts. Fair. So those are some of the props that I like. I've got one more prop, but go ahead and slide yours in here, Eddie. Uh, on I, I, I have a prop that I like, too. Okay. It's plus 140. At least that's what I got it at. 
uh, for there to be a return on the opening kickoff. Ooh. No touchback. No. Too much nerves from Butker or Jake Elliott? Well, here's the... Bucker's got a booming leg. Are you sure about that? Yeah, but here's there's some science behind it. McAfee's explained it. Aren't we indoors? It's indoors, but the football they use to kick off the Super Bowl isn't roughed up. Look at this. It's not kicked prior. It's not touched prior to kickoff. So it's got, it's a lot more firm. So it doesn't have the same, I don't know, how do you want to describe it? The, uh, it doesn't mold around the foot, I, I, I suppose. I'll let you talk with about firmness of the balls and whatever you're going with here. <laughs> I didn't say it that way oh, for that specific okay. reason. Uh, but my Super Bowl pick, I'm going to go Eagles in overtime. 33-30. Eagles in overtime, 33-30. What's your final prop you like over there? Uh, the final prop I like, and again, this is one for involve the you know involve your significant others in this one. The jersey number of the player who scores the first touchdown. Oh. Odd minus 200, even plus 150. Ooh. So I think a big reason for that is you've got Travis Kelsey at 87, AJ Brown, Brown at 11. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Devontae Smith is six, is and you have right? Jalen Hurts as one, right? Jalen Hurts running the ball. What about our running backs? What what number is Miles Sanders? Pa- 21. 20. I thought he was 26. What about Pacheco? He's 10. Okay. Yeah, like Sanders is 26. Pacheco is 10. What's McKinnon? Oh. Uh, He's a single digit one? number. McKinnon is one. And then Marquez Valdez Scantling is the only player not named Travis Kelsey to have a receiving touchdown. He's 11. So this is a little math, you know, a little odds. Again, odd is the heavy favorite, minus 200 here, but I think, I think that's a. Boston that's Scott a, that's has a, that's a pair. That's a fun one. Boston Scott's got a pair of rushing touchdowns, and he's number two. Dallas Goddard is 88. So for even numbers, you'd be looking at Goddard, Devontae Smith, um, 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 Kenneth Gainwell, our guy. Not our guy, sorry. Pascal? He's, yeah, he's uh, numero three. Can you imagine the odds you get if Zach Pascal scores the first touchdown? He gets uh, crazy odds. Miles that. Sanders. So, yeah, that's on the Eagles side. Buff chick. What? I need buff chick dip. I need a taco dip. I need some oh, yeah. in a blanket. What's your favorite go-to food on Super Bowl Sunday? Yeah, it's got to be a little taco dip, Tostito scoops. Give me some buff chick, nacho cheese Doritos. I could go for a cheese platter. Love some buff chick action. Um, again, pigs in a blanket. I could eat some pizza, but I could totally be good with just all that. I'm a pigs in a blanket and a wings guy. Could throw some wings in there too. Again, I, I could probably just go with dips and just, you know, kind of regret it till Wednesday. But I don't know who is the amount of emotions in the Bowen household between my excitement about the Super Bowl and Maddie's excitement about no football until September. Yeah, it kind of rivals it. But hey, love Rihanna. Hope Kesha makes an appearance at halftime. Looking forward to that. Eddie Garrison, if this podcast doesn't live for, you know, an hour. Days, not hours. I will cry. Yeah, great point. Uh, Thank you as always, and we'll talk to you whenever the Colts hire head coach. See you.